Great. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for coming out while well, showing up on a Friday evening to hear the talk. Um, like I said a couple weeks ago, um, this is kind of a new thing for us, this October October Fest fundraiser. Um, and we've been really pleased with how, how it's turned out. It's really been fun for us to get to give some presentations um, that we wouldn't otherwise get to give. Um, and we're also so appreciative for all of the donations and the support that you've given us um, in the last few weeks. We really appreciate it. Um, and it makes a big difference to all of our programs to have the support of our community so that we can keep providing environmental education and restoring habitat for native plants and animals. Um, I think I've, you've all been here for a program before or were here two weeks ago for the winter bird identification program. Um, so I'm not gonna give any introduction to the organization, but if you have any questions, um, please let me know. My name is Eleanor Harris. I am one of the co-directors here at the Clifton Institute. Also on the call is my husband and co-director, Bert Harris. So if you have any questions about anything that we're working on, um, maybe at the end of the talk, we would be happy to talk to you and answer any of those. Um, we are still offering in-person programs and we have bird walks coming up as well as a few other things. Um, that's all on our website calendar and I hope we'll see you here in person sometime soon. Um, and tonight, of course, I'm talking about the evolution and biology of birdsong. My two favorite topics in biology are evolutionary biology. Um, I just think it's fascinating to think about how, how all the plants and animals that live here got to be the way they are. I'm also really interested in the social behavior of animals. I think it's so fascinating to think about how animals work together um, to cooperate, uh, to solve problems, to make their livings, to form social systems. Um, and I think birdsong is kind of the perfect intersection of those two topics. It has a really interesting evolutionary story, which I'll get into tonight. Um, and it's really also the core of a lot of social behavior in birds. It helps birds communicate and cooperate and form social systems. So birdsong for me is kind of the perfect um, interesting topic in biology. Um, in terms of what I'll talk about tonight, this is my brief outline. I'll start with some of the basics of birdsong talking about what just what it is and why they sing, how they sing, um, and then I'll move on to talk about the evolution of birdsong, where it came from, how it's being selected, and how it has led to the speciation of birds. So the most basic question is, what is a birdsong? Um, most birds have two types of vocalizations. Songs are longer, more complex, to our ear often more beautiful vocalizations produced mostly by males during the breeding season. Whereas calls are shorter, simpler, often less beautiful vocalizations produced by both sexes throughout the year. Um, so there are some differences that we can hear with our ears, but um, really it's about how they're used rather than how they sound. Um, and most bird watchers and scientists have a, a rough agreement on what counts as a song and what counts as a call, but of course it's not always cut and dried and there's some wishy-washy areas. So I'm gonna to try to play a few examples. So this is the song. Eleanor, Eleanor I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing your screen. I don't know, maybe that's just on my end, but it's a little <laughs> screen. Maybe am I? Hopefully I'm the only one. Given how this evening is going, I imagine not. I see the screen, but there's a big audacity. Welcome to audacity in front yeah. of it. Well, then it's working. You can't see it, Bert? No, but that's probably my, I'll figure, I'll try to figure it out, sorry. Okay, you should all be seeing a pink and blue blur on your screens right now. And all I'm gonna do is play, thank you, Beth, is play the song of the song sparrow. So you can hear, I think that's a beautiful sound. Um, it's quite long, it lasts a few seconds. There are a lot of notes in there. There are lots of different lengths of notes. Um, so it's complicated and beautiful. Um, and this is the song of the song sparrow compared to its call, which is this. So it's quite a bit shorter, very simple, just a little chip, chip. Cheap. 
um, not quite as beautiful. So in this species, there's a really big difference between their song and their call. They sound very different and they're used for very different purposes. Um, another example is the white-throated sparrow. Uh, I'm so sorry, I'm having technical difficulties tonight. Okay. okay, let's try to hear the song of a white-throated sparrow. So this is the song of the white-throated sparrow. You can hear again, it's another quite long vocalization, very beautiful, has lots of different notes in there. Um, this, if you're trying to learn how to identify bird songs by ear, this is a great one to start with. Um, the mnemonic that bird watchers like to use is Old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. So it has a cute little mnemonic. Um, there are lots of these around right now. They come in flocks, so it's a great one to start practicing with if you're trying to learn your bird songs. Um, we can contrast that with the call of the white-throated sparrow, which is this. So again, it's a very short, very simple vocalization um, that's the call and not the song. Um, you can hear it's also quite similar to the song of the song or the call of the song sparrow that I played. Um, there are lots of birds that have very short chips that are their calls. Um, and this is why this is why it's challenging to listen to birds in the winter when this is all that they're doing. Um, so that's the kind of stereotype of a song is that it's very long and beautiful. There are there's a whole spectrum of songs. So some of them are quite simple and maybe not so beautiful. Um, so one of those would be the grasshopper sparrow, which you can hear singing here at the Clifton Institute in the summer. And this is its call, or song rather. That's all it is. It's a little buzzy note, um, but that counts as its song because of the way that it uses that vocalization. Um, and you can maybe guess from that sound why it's called the grasshopper sparrow. It, kind of sounds like a bug. At the other end of the spectrum, um, I googled around what people think is the most complex bird song in the world. And this is the answer that I found in multiple sources, the sedge warbler. So here is the song of the said worker. Well, it actually goes on like that for a couple of minutes. Um, this is not a bird that lives in North America, but it might be worth a trip to Europe someday to go and hear one of the most complex bird songs in the world. So songs can really range from quite simple um, to really complex, um, but they're all used in similar ways. Okay, let me get back to my presentation. Okay. Yeah, Eleanor, there's a comment there that, um... We could see the spectrogram is complicated, but we couldn't hear it. It was really quiet. Okay. So just so you know. Thank you. Um, Allison's in the waiting room also. Sorry for the interruption. Thank you. I don't see how to enter. Thank you all for bearing with me. Okay, here we go.
Okay, so these are the birds that it has played. It played the song and the call of the song sparrow, the song and the call of the white-throated sparrow, um, the song of the grasshopper sparrow, and the song of the sedge warbler. Um, so those are some of the birds in the world that sing, but is there kind of an organizing principle to which birds sing and which don't? Um, there is, and to understand it, we have to go back to high school biology and refresh our memory of how all biological life is organized. So all living organisms on the planet are organized into kingdoms. Those are animals, plants, fungi, protists, as well as a couple others that are teeny tiny and hard to see. Each kingdom is then divided into phyla. So for instance, within the animals, um, there's a phylum of all the chordates and there's a phylum of all the mollusks. Phyla are then divided into classes. So within the chordates, there is a bird class of, or the class aves and there's a class of mammals. Classes are then divided into orders. So for instance, within the birds, there are what are called the passeriforms and there are what are called the anseriforms. Orders are then divided into families like all the crows or all the cardinals, which are then divided into genera, which are finally divided into species. So that is the hierarchy of life. And within birds, there are 40 orders. So these are above families. This is quite big groups of birds. Um, there are 40 of them. And within each order, birds look roughly the same, but there can be quite a lot of diversity within each order. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the orders. It's just to show all the different types of birds there are in the world. And singing has only been documented in six of them. Those are the nightjars, the hummingbirds, the cuckoos, the owls, the parrots, and the perching birds. And of those, the perching birds are really the special ones. Um, they're called perching birds, or also called passerines, because they have three toes pointing forward and one point pointing back. So that allows them to sit on a branch and perch um, compared to something like a woodpecker that has two toes in the front and two toes in the back, so it has to kind of cling to a, a tree and can't properly sit on a branch. Um, and there are two suborders within that group. The first is called the subossines, um, and we have subossines here in North America. Some examples would be these flycatchers, like a peewee or a phoebe. Um, but pretty much if you did a really mean thing and threw a dart out your window, you would be likely to hit an ossine passerine. Most of the backyard birds or feeder birds, even if you go on a walk, most of the birds that we see around us are ossine passerines. So this is just a small sample of some of the birds that you might be familiar with from your feeder or just going on a walk around town. Things like blue jays, chickadees, um, titmice, nuthatches, all sorts of different sparrows, cardinals, um, starlings and blackbirds, finches. Most of the birds that we're the most familiar, familiar with are ossine passerines. And the ossine passerines are really the birds that sing. They're the ones that are, we call songbirds because most ossines have complex songs and most other birds don't. There are some exceptions, like I said, that have songs, but by and large, singing birds are ossine passerines. And about 5,000 of the world's 10,000 species of birds are songbirds. So not just here in North America, but around the world, if you just found a random bird, chances are that it would be a songbird or an ossine passerine. And that's a point that I'll come back to later in the talk. Um, so how do these birds sing? They have a special structure called the syrinx. So our voice box is the larynx up here in our throats. The bird's voice box essentially, the syrinx, sits at the junction of the two tubes coming from their two lungs. Um, different birds have different architectures. Some of them have two separate voice boxes in their two tubes. Some of them have the voice box right at the junction. Some of them have it a little bit further up where the two tubes have merged, but they all have um, a searing somewhere in that junction um, where their two tubes from their lungs are joining. And because some of them have two um, tubes or two voice boxes that can produce sounds, they can do some really amazing things. Um, so one example is a very familiar bird, the northern cardinal. Um, I'm not going to try to play its song since that seems to not be going well, but if you know its song, it has these repeated whistles that go down, choo, 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 choo. And each of those whistles, it actually takes turns using each of the two tubes coming from its two lungs. So one of the tubes is responsible for the high frequency sounds, and the other tube is responsible for the low frequency sounds, and it can switch between its tubes instantaneously within each of those whistles. 
Um, so the little the, the diagram shows the sounds coming from the two tubes, and then the graph on the right um, is called the spectrogram. And on the horizontal axis is time, so you can kind of read it from going you know, left to right, going forward in time. And the, the vertical axis is the frequency of the pitch that you would be hearing. So high up on the graph is a very high pitch, and low is a low pitch. So each of these downward sweeps represents one of those choo, 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 choo whistles. And you can see by the color that they're switching in the, uh, between their two tubes mid-whistle, which is just kind of an amazing gymnastic feat that we are not at all capable of. Another really cool thing that some birds do is that they can actually use both of the tubes at once. So this is something that something like a wood thrush can do. It has a beautiful, amazingly complex song. Um, it's one of the prettiest songs in the, in the spring to go here. Um, and they can actually produce songs from both tubes at once, which contributes to how um, beautiful and complex the song is. Um, different species have different repertoires. So some species, each individual can have a whole repertoire of songs. They can sing multiple songs. Um, an example of that would be a song sparrow, which has been documented to sing up to 13 songs. So a single male can have 13 different variants of, this, of a song sparrow song that it can produce. Um, reading about song sparrows, I think it's made me realize how little I appreciate them. I kind of know the song of a song sparrow and I can identify it when I hear it. Um, but I think I didn't quite appreciate how complex their vocalizations can be. So I'm gonna be paying a little bit closer attention and seeing how many songs I can hear from any given male in the future. Um, in other species, an individual can only produce one song. Its whole life it learns a song and that's the one that it's stuck with. So an example of that would be a field sparrow. A male field sparrow will learn a song and that's, that'll be the one that it uses for the rest of its life. Um, as you may be familiar with, if you ever go on a bird walk, um, they tend to sing, especially in the summer, early in the morning. You can go out on a bird walk in the summer and just be confronted with a cacophony of noise that bird watchers call the dawn chorus. It's, it's quite an amazing phenomenon. And there are a few hypotheses to explain why so many birds sing early in the morning, um, but I don't think scientists really have a, a great consensus of which of these hypotheses explains that phenomenon. So one hypothesis is that Early in the morning, all of the heat has left and kind of gone higher up in the atmosphere and the air down close to the ground is still quite cold. So when the birds sing, for whatever kind of physical reasons, based on the, that temperature gradient, their songs bounce off the earth and go a very long distance to other birds that might be hearing them. Whereas when the air gets hot, their sounds kind of drift away up into the atmosphere. So the temperature conditions in the morning seem to be good for propagating their songs at long distances. Um, another explanation is just that when it's still dawn, it's still it's kind of hard, hard to forage, it's hard to hunt or look for bugs or leaves or seeds or whatever you're trying to eat, so they might as well be singing. Um, there are several other hypotheses as well, and this is kind of a, one of the many um, open questions about bird song. Um, another thing, interesting thing to think about in Bird song is that sounds propagate differently in different environments. So for instance, in a forest, there are lots of tree trunks, there are lots of leaves. It's a very dense, complex habitat. If you try to propagate a sound in that habitat, the sounds might reverberate, they might bounce off the leaves, or they might get muffled in all that foliage. So the birds have to adapt to the different habitats where they might be singing. Um, in the forest in particular, it might be a good idea to sing a song with a narrow range of frequencies. So not try to produce all sorts of different notes, but pick a note that you can dedicate yourself to so that you're not some, singing something too complex that's gonna get muffled as it bounces around. Um, lower notes also propagate better in the forest. Um, that's also a good idea to take a pause between your notes so that you can give each note the chance to propagate before you put another one after it and they don't get all jumbled together. Um, and you can see that that is actually what the birds do. Um, this is a really interesting paper um, that took uh, the, lumped a bunch of species together that lived in six different habitats, um, a marsh, an open grassland, a shrubland, a couple types of forests. Um, and they saw the percentage of the species that lived in those habitats that took long breaks between their, um, between their notes and the percentage of species that have very buzzy songs. So you can see in the more open habitats, species don't take breaks between, between their notes and they have very buzzy songs and the converse in the forest. Um, so birds adapt their songs to whatever habitat it is that they're trying to sing in, which is really cool. Um, and another thing that I, I think I've, I've been aware of, but I'm gonna try to keep an ear out for next time I go for a walk. Um, 
And why do birds sing? I've touched on this a little bit. It's really all about breeding. So males sing either to attract females. Um, females often decide which male to mate with based on the song that it's producing, or they sing to compete for territories and establish their dominance relationships with other males. So it can be a, more of a male-male competition thing that they're singing between their territories to kind of establish their relationship and figure out where the boundary between their territories are. And for this reason, since it's so breeding centric, um, songs are really mostly sung in the spring and summer when breeding is most active. Um, song sparrows are one of the best studied birds, at least here in North America, and there's a lot that we know about how they establish their territories. Song sparrows can actually tell their neighbors apart and they know where their neighbors belong. So if you do a playback experiment, if you have maybe four neighbors around a given male, and if you fool it by playing recordings of the wrong males in the wrong places, it acts agitated and you can kind of tell that it knows something's up and the neighbors that belong in certain places aren't where they belong, which is just kind of an amazing feat for their little brains to do. Um, they also have kind of private languages with each of their neighbors. So out in a field, each male has its given territory. Um, but like I said, they can have a large repertoire. They can sing up to 13 songs and different males have slightly different songs. So each male will have a little bit of a private language and have a particular song that it sings with maybe neighbor A and a different song that it sings with neighbor B, a different one than with neighbor C. It's really kind of a complex language that's going on out there. Um, it's also interesting to note that males that have more shared songs with their neighbors seem to hold on to their territories longer. So females um, seem to like something about males that are able to have a lot of flexibility in their songs. And finally, an interesting fact is that they can actually can identify all of their neighbor songs, but they can't actually identify their own song. So if you play them a recording of their own song, they'll act, they'll behave towards it as if it's a total stranger. So they have this amazing ability to learn all of their neighbor songs, but there's a missing piece that they can't actually tell their own song, which is kind of funny. Um, song sparrows aren't the only ones that have been shown to be able to recognize individual birds based on their song, uh, based on their songs. That ability has been documented in white-throated sparrows, oven birds, indigo buntings, field sparrows, yellow throats, red-winged blackbirds. That's the list that I was able to find. Um, this is one of those abilities that I think that we think of as quite human. So we're slowly kind of very assiduously documenting it in lots and lots of species, and we're amazed every time we find it. But I suspect that it's quite widespread and it's probably more the rule rather than the exception and we're just kind of learning that now. And because they can recognize each other, they can actually start to work together and cooperate. So individual recognition based on their songs can actually lead to cooperation, which I think is just super fascinating. One example of that is in male red-winged blackbirds. Um, male red-winged blackbirds that have more neighbors that they've been around for a longer time versus a male red-winged blackbird in a brand new neighborhood will have more offspring. And that's probably because once they form kind of a gang of neighbors that all recognize each other, they can more easily cooperate to either mob predators and get them out of their area or to chase off newcomer males. So once males start to recognize each other, they can form a little gang based on, based on their songs, which is a really interesting, complicated, fascinating social behavior these birds engage in. Um, I've talked a lot about song and I'm going to continue to talk about song, um, but I did want to just briefly touch on why birds call. And the, the purpose of calls are really very different than the purpose of song. So birds call as alarm calls, so to share information with each other that maybe a predator is present or that they're going to go chase a predator out of the area. Um, they also make what are called contact calls. So that's just kind of chatting while they're out in the forest or out in the woods or the fields. Um, they just kind of keep in touch with each other, make little chips so that they know where each other are. Um, they also make very specific calls as they're migrating. The flight calls they produce um, often at night when they're migrating overhead, you can hear teeny tiny chips that really expert bird watchers can identify the species. Um, and I think we don't really fully understand why they're making those calls. Um, and I think in, if you're a bird watcher trying to learn to identify uh, birds by ear, songs are really the place to start because as we saw at the beginning, calls are so similar um, and they can be quite hard to identify. But once you do, that's really where the fun can be in kind of trying to decode what the birds are saying to each other because they have different calls for different purposes and it can be fun to try to decode what they're saying. Um, how do birds know what to sing? So most of the songbirds that I'm talking about learn their songs, but not their calls. 
which is kind of an interesting distinction. So they're born knowing what calls that they're gonna make, but they have to learn their songs from another male in the population. Um, I think there must be exceptions to that rule of thumb, but I have not been able to find any, and I would be very interested to know if you know of one. Um, some parrots and hummingbirds actually also learn their vocalizations. Um, and one sub osseine passerine has been documented to learn its song. It's this ridiculous looking bird, the three bottled bell bird, um, which has a kind of a funny squawk. Um, and some people argue that it has to learn that squawk, um, but there's been quite a bit of debate about that point. Um, there's a very short period of time when birds are born, when they're able to learn their song. Um, and they can, there's just a couple months, and if they don't manage to learn a song in that period, they might not be able to learn one for the rest of their lives. And most birds can't learn any old song. Um, if they're taught, often in an experimental setting, if they're taught the song of the wrong species, they grow up with kind of a garbled song that is neither the song that they're supposed to be learning or the one that they were taught. There is a really interesting exception to that, which is in the group of birds we call the mimids. Um, this is a group of birds that spread around the world, but we have three representatives of them here in the Eastern North America, uh, which are the Northern Mockingbird, the Brown Thrasher, and the Gray Catbird. And these three birds, as well as all the other mimids, have just an astounding ability to learn the calls of lots of other species of birds, as well as non-bird sounds. So some of them can learn the alarm call of a, of a car alarm or a chainsaw or all sorts of crazy sounds. Um, but mostly they're learning um, all sorts of different species of birds that are around them as they're growing up. Um, and I've shown them in the order of their learning ability as well as their mimicry ability. So a northern mockingbird can learn up to 100 songs of different birds and reproduce them with really amazing accuracy. A brown thrasher can learn not quite so many not do quite so well at reproducing them. And the great cat bird, um, Bert likes to say, it's quite impressionist. So you can kind of hear what it was trying to mimic, but it's a little bit fuzzy. Um, but these are really three really cool species to keep an eye out for as you go on a bird walk. Um, so that's the basics of bird song. Um, songs are long, complicated vocalizations that are produced by Ossian passerines, also known as the songbirds, for purposes of attracting females and establishing territories and songbirds have to learn their songs. Um, let me pop out and see if there are any questions in the chat. Let's see. Oh, and someone asks, are starlings mimids? That's a great question. Starlings are not in the same group of species. Um, so they're not evolutionarily related to the mimics, but they do have some mimicry ability, as do yellow-breasted chats. And there are a couple other examples that have some mimicry ability, but aren't properly within that group. Um, that's a great question. Any other questions? Okay. I'll keep an eye on that as we go. Okay, so now on to the evolution of birdsong. Um, as you probably know, birds are actually a type of dinosaur. They, they uh, diverge from dinosaurs. Um, so far, no dinosaur fossils with syrinxes have been found. Um, a really ancient bird called the Vegavis, which apparently was something like a duck, which I'm showing here. We've, um, their fossil of it was found in Antarctica and they found a fossil syrinx in it from 69 to 66 million years ago, which is just astounding. Um, so syrinxes have been around at least that long, although this syrinx apparently would have sounded something like a duck, so not, not super complex vocalization, but it would have been able to produce some kind of bird-like vocalization. Um, but it appears that the syrinx is a relatively recent innovation, so 69 to 66 million years ago. It's a long time, but it was pretty much a brand new innovation that the birds um, in, invented, um, created for themselves, and none of their ancestors um, apparently had that structure or were able to sing at all. And this is a question I've become interested in recently. Why did birds evolve song at all? Um, and I, I think it's one that we don't really have a good understanding or a good answer for. Um, I don't know why there aren't lots of reptiles that have beautiful songs or other groups that have beautiful songs. Um, my thoughts on the question are maybe that 
Unlike mammals, birds have small enough territories that it makes sense to be able to communicate with their neighbors through sound. So if you think about black bears or coyotes or foxes, maybe they're spread out over such large areas that they don't need to be able to communicate through sound. And at the other end of the spectrum, maybe reptiles and amphibians, frogs, salamanders, turtles, that kind of thing, they have small territories, but they don't move around an awful lot. So they don't need to know where their neighbors are all the time. So maybe they don't need to sing to each other. Um, those are totally just my hypotheses. And I, I hope this is a question that maybe we have a better understanding of in a few years. Um, songs do change over time. That's something that we can observe now and we imagine has been happening for a long time. Um, and there are a few different reasons why songs might change. Um, one is to adapt to environmental factors. Another is that birds sometimes make up a new song and then their compatriots learn the new song. And then finally, sexual selection drives changes in songs. And I'll talk about each of the, these three possibilities. Um, so like I said earlier, songs propagate differently in different environments. Um, and so if a population of birds moves into a new environment, they might have to change their songs to make sure that they can propagate there. This is a really interesting example, um, not from North America, but interesting nonetheless, called the Greenish Warbler. Um, this is its range map, all the colored areas on the map. So you can see it's in Russia and Mongolia, China, all throughout Southern Asia. And it started in kind of the yellow area and then apparently moved off to both the Northeast and the Northwest. And it moved into more forested habitats as it moved north and its song adapted um, to those new habitats in ways that you can predict. So one of the things it did is made its song lower frequency. So you can compare the songs in the blue and the red areas to the yellow songs and see that this bird has actually changed its song to propagate in the new habitat where it moved into. Um, this is an interesting example from just this year. Um, one of the environmental factors that birds have to deal with now is noise pollution. So if they're living anywhere near a city, they'll have traffic noise among many other noises that they have to make sure their songs can be heard over. Um, one of the ways they adapt to that is as if they were living in a forest, they can't really afford to make a wide range of frequencies because that wide range of frequencies will just get garbled when it's competing with all of the car noise around them. Um, so in the white crowned sparrow in particular, this is a super well studied, super well documented species of birds um, across North America. And there's a population in San Francisco in particular that has been studied for a long time. Before the COVID-19 shutdown, which you can see on the um, horizontal axis, there's a column for before, there was an urban population in red and a rural population in blue. And the red population in urban areas had a very short range of its songs. And just during this year, because of the COVID shutdown, when there aren't so many cars out on the streets, it's been able to broaden out its song because all of a sudden there isn't all that noise pollution that it has to compete with. Um, so that's kind of an interesting, um, somewhat optimistic story that birds can um, kind of rebound when noise pollution is either imposed or reduced. Um, they can also change their songs just because of learning. Um, this is another very well-documented species, the white-throated sparrow. Um, and like I said earlier, their song is traditionally thought of as Old Sam, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Um, but apparently within the last few decades, birds have shown up in Northwest, um, the, the Northwest US and Western Canada that started saying, Old Sam, Peba, 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 Peba. And that population is shown in purple in the first graph. And then as time has gone on, that song has rapidly spread throughout the country, apparently because other birds liked the sound of that new song and they started to learn it and now lots of birds are doing it. So once, a, once an individual bird innovates a new song because they learn their songs, that song can spread rapidly throughout the population, which is really interesting. Because they're such good learners, that can actually lead to uh, distinct dialects in different geographic locations. So birds can start to learn from each other and it's like any kind of cultural phenomenon. Birds in the same area will start to sound and talk like each other and birds in another area will have their own separate dialects. Um, 
like I said, white crowned sparrows in San Francisco have been very well studied. So even within the city, there are distinct dialects. That's, that's what this map is showing. Um, there's an orange dialect and a red dialect. Even within the city, distinct populations of white crowned sparrows have slightly different sounding um, songs. Dialects have also been documented in song sparrows and in morning warblers, um, but again, this is a phenomenon that I think is probably very widespread and scientists are just now doing all the work to catch up and document all the different species that have dialects because they learn their songs from each other. And now we get to my favorite part of the talk, sexual selection. Um, songs take a lot of energy to produce. They can be really cognitively difficult to produce and to learn. Um, taking the time to sing a really long song and to do it repeatedly over the course of the day can take time away from more important tasks like eating, and it can also draw the attention of predators. In all those ways, it's kind of like a peacock's tail. A peacock's tail takes a lot of material to produce. Um, it is a lot of work to drag that thing through the forest, and it must get eaten by predators because it's slow moving through the forest and it's a very bright showy bird that a predator is easy to see. But for some reason, even though songs and peacock tails are, have a lot of downsides, they continue to persist. And the interesting question is why? Um, I think, oops, we often think about natural selection when we think about evolution. So natural selection chooses traits that help an animal survive to reproductive age. In birds, that can be things like a raptor's talons, which help it catch food, uh, maybe a camouflage plumage that helps something like a woodcock hide from predators, maybe webbed feet helping a duck swim. Traits like that are very obvious, obviously beneficial to the bird. They help it make its living in some habitat or other. Songs, peacock tails, they seem like they would not help a bird survive, and yet they exist. And the explanation is that they are not being acted on by natural selection, rather they are being acted on by sexual selection. Sexual selection chooses traits that help an animal reproduce, either by helping it compete with other males for females or by attracting females. So even if it maybe means, means this peacock or a songbird lives a slightly shorter life, for some reason, in some way, it helps its genes pass on to the next generation and when it comes to evolution, really passing on your genes is the only thing that matters. So sexual, so sexual selection can lead to um, what would otherwise seem like maybe disadvantage, disadvantageous traits evolving and persisting in the population. Um, there are many interesting examples of sexual selection. I think the peacock is the classical one. Um, it can act on not just individual birds, but on whole groups of birds. So in a group of birds called the mannequins, males will actually work together in complex cooperative ma uh, mating displays, breeding displays. That's what I'm showing in the upper left corner. The blue mannequins here are working together to attract a female. Um, the birds of paradise are also really famous for their amazing uh, mating displays like this one in the lower left. Um, and then here in North America, the sage grouse are famous for their just wackadoodle, crazy sexual displays. Um, it has these, this one in particular, the greater sage grouse has inflated sacks and a crazy spiky tail and a mohawk and does a dance and sexual selection just, can just lead to an amazing diversity of displays. Um, but the, the, the basis for sexual selection is that females prefer these crazy traits. They prefer a peacock with a big tail. They prefer a sage grouse that does a crazy dance. Um, but in bird song, females mate with males that sing the right song for their species. So there's a very strong selection for a white-throated sparrow to sound like a white-throated sparrow. But females also have specific traits that they really like within songs. Um, so some females really love males to produce a wide repertoire of songs. So Song sparrows that can sing those 13 different songs apparently are very sexy to a female song sparrow. Um, this also seems to be what's going on in the mimic. So mockingbirds that can sing, that can reproduce the songs of many, many other species apparently are more attractive to females. Um, there are also specific song traits um, like length. So for instance, swamp sparrows, um, the females apparently like songs with a wide variety of notes. 
Um, house finch females apparently like long, fast songs. Black capped chickadees apparently like very long songs. So the females of different species have kind of honed in on different traits that they really like the males to produce as extreme versions of as they can. Um, the question is, why do they have those specific preferences? Well, for one thing, for, for females to prefer the males of the right, the quote unquote, right species makes perfect sense because they don't want to waste their energy or resources on mating with a male of the wrong species. They might not be able to reproduce at all, or they might make a, a hybrid that's not very fit. So females don't want to waste um, their time mating with a male of a different species, and picking a male with the right song helps them do that. But with respect to those specific traits, so with uh, having a very long song, having a fast trill rate, having lots of different songs, um, it seems that females prefer whatever it is the most physically challenging song for a male to produce. That's the one that females are going to prefer because it shows how strong and healthy and dominant the male that can produce such a physically challenging song is. Um, so if the female mates with a really healthy male that she can tell because it has this amazing song, that might mean that he's healthy enough to stick around and take care of the offspring or he's gonna pass on his healthy genes to their offspring. So it's a good idea to mate with a big, strong, healthy male bird. It can actually get even more complicated than that. There's something called the sexy sun hypothesis. And the idea in the sexy sun hypothesis is that as soon as there's a slight preference for a given song in the population, a female will wanna mate with a male with that trait because their offspring, her sons, will then have that song as well. And that son will get to reproduce a lot because there's that preference in the females. So again, so once a female knows that there's a preference for a certain song in a population, she'll want to mate with a male of that song so that their son becomes sexy to the next generations of females. And they'll have more sons and more sons and more sons and eventually many, many grandchildren and their genes will continue to get passed on. This is a little bit of a controversial topic. I think different people disagree on how well it's been documented, but I think there are some firm cases where it has been, and it's a really interesting positive feedback loop that can happen with sexual selection. Um, it's all very hard to document, even if we could perceive the songs in the same way that the birds do, which we absolutely cannot. It's always really hard to study why females have the preferences they do. It's always gonna be hard to try to get into the head um, of another animal. And some people just think that beauty is in the ear of the bird. Songs are somewhat like fashion trends. They kind of change arbitrarily. Whatever is deemed beautiful within a particular species takes off for a time. Maybe it'll change in the future. And we may not have a, a great grasp of why they change any more than we can have a great grasp of why fashions in humans change. Um, so, so those are some of the ways that songs can change over time. And changes in songs can actually lead to new species. So as a refresher, female birds often choose who to mate with based on the songs that the males sing. So if two subgroups of a species start to develop slightly different songs, that means females from those two groups aren't going to be attracted to males of the other group anymore. So they're going to stop interbreeding. And after long enough, those two subgroups might actually become two separate species. So if two subgroups develop slightly different songs, that can actually lead to, to the creation of two new species. And this is actually seen across the, the world of diversity of birds. There are many pairs of sister species that pretty much only differ in the songs that they can sing. Um, one example you can see here is the Eastern towhee, which has a sister species in the West called the spotted towhee that, as you can see, look quite similar, but have identifiably different songs. Um, and I actually grew up calling these rufous-sided tovies, you may recall that, that name, because they used to be considered the same species because they're so similar, but eventually it was determined that they had songs different enough to be considered different species. Another example would be eastern meadowlarks, which are here in Virginia, and western meadowlarks, which are found in the western part of the continent. Again, you can see they look very, very similar, but they have different songs, and it's likely that the different songs that they produce led to uh, their speciation. A final example um, of birds that at least migrate through the area would be gray cheeked thrush and pignell thrush. They look very, very similar. Expert bird watchers can see the, the small details that make them different, but the easiest way to tell them apart is by their very different songs. And there are many, many other similar examples.
I'll come back to the um, example of the greenish warbler. warbler. Like I said earlier, this species started down in kind of India in that yellow area and then spread both to the northwest and to the northeast. And those two populations developed different songs as they went, as it went into the blue area and into the red area. But what's interesting is that its song changed in two different ways so that the blue and the red areas now have completely different songs and they can no longer interbreed with each other. So birds in the blue area can breed with birds in the yellow area. Birds in the red area can also breed with uh, birds in the yellow area. But bluebirds and redbirds can no longer mate with each other. This is what's called a ring species. Um, and this is just a thorn in the side of evolutionary biologists because no one knows quite not to, no one really knows what to do with the species. Should they be divided because the red and the blue birds can't interbreed? Should it be considered a single species because there's a whole spectrum of birds that can interbreed um, and it's all somewhat based on their song, which is really interesting. Um, part of the reason that uh, things like that can happen, that birds can start to diverge so quickly based on their songs is that learned songs can change really, really quickly. Um, again, if we come back to the white crowned sparrow, uh, one of the best documented birds in the world, just in the last 40 years, their song has changed quite a bit. So on the right hand, I'm showing on the top line a recording of a white crowned sparrow in 1979. And on the bottom line, a recording of a white crowned sparrow in 2003. And apparently, if you play the recording of a 1979 bird to a 2003 bird, it basically doesn't recognize it as the same species. So just in the last couple of decades, just by process of innovation and learning, the song has changed so much that it no longer recognizes maybe it's great, 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 great grandparents as being in the same species. Um, and since that can happen so quickly, um, population can start to diverge really rapidly. So like I said earlier, about 5,000 of the world's 10,000 species of birds are songbirds. Another way to say that is, as I said earlier, there are 40 orders of birds. So naively, we might assume that the 10,000 species should be distributed evenly across those 40 orders but that's not at all the case. One order of birds has more than half of all species, which is just astounding. And one popular hypothesis for why that is, is because they learn their songs. So the question is, does learning songs make evolution happen more quickly? So the reason that might be would be that learning can generate new songs very, very quickly. And maybe a population can settle on that new song very quickly because it's learned, and that leads to divergence. On the other hand, um, this is actually something that I studied in my postdoc at the University of Maryland. I developed a mathematical model that shows that a population can actually take longer to settle on a given song when it's learned rather than genetically inherited. And you would think that maybe young males could just learn the song of the other subgroup if they're so good at learning. Um, so there are very strong arguments for learning either accelerating speciation or decelerating speciation. And this is a topic of very active research and the jury is still out. Um, so I'll wrap up. Um, the basics of bird song are that songs are long complicated vocalizations produced by Aussie passerines to attract males and establish territories. Um, birds apparently evolved the syrinx out of the blue and we still don't really understand why. Bird songs can change because of environmental factors, by learning, or by sexual selection. And changes in bird song can lead to the creation of new bird species, which may or may not happen more quickly because songbirds learn their songs. Um, if you want to learn more about birds, I hope you'll come to a bird walk sometime soon. They're on second Wednesdays and fourth Saturdays. You can come try to learn how to identify bird songs for yourself. Um, and these, if you're interested in learning more, I would say these are my four favorite popular books about birdsong that I've read recently. The first one is a little bit technical, but the other three are very accessible and very interesting reads on birdsongs. Um, so thank you all for listening. I think I have some questions in the chat and I'm gonna try, I see two, two questions. If you have more questions, chime in in the chat or you can turn your microphone on and I would be happy to answer questions that way. Um, so someone asks, do cuckoo chicks learn the song of their host? That's an interesting question, one I was actually researching myself. Um, Cuckoos are not uh, Aussies, so I think by and large they inherit their songs genetically. Um, they don't have as complex songs as the Aussies, um, and so even though they are 
born in the nest of a different species, they don't learn the song of their host species. They are born knowing the appropriate song for their species. I think I haven't found a ton of information about that and I would like to learn more. Um, someone also asks, since sub songs are not as complex, is sexual selection based on something else? Also a great question. Um, sexual selection may somewhat act on songs and sub um, but probably they act more on their plumage and on their mating displays. Um, there are also very many interesting examples of birds constructing things or bringing things to their females to attract them. Um, so there might be other mating behaviors in different species rather than their songs. Great. Thank you, everybody. I'll hang out if anyone has any questions. And I hope we will see you in person sometime soon. And thank you, Kurt, for the recommendation. I'll check out Dr. Omland. Oh, someone asks me to walk through the ring species again right now. I can walk through the ring species again if anyone would like. Here we go. The idea with the ring species is the birds started in the yellow area. They have since there's an, the hole in the middle is a desert that apparently is inhospitable to this species. So they've moved around the desert, both to the Northwest and to the Northeast. And as the population spread in those two directions, their songs changed, um, but not in the same way. So the birds moving to the Northwest and to the Northeast developed slightly different songs. And the songs are now so different that the birds in the blue and the red areas can no longer recognize each other as being of the same species. But the process was so gradual that along the rainbow, so blue to green to yellow to orange to red, each subsequent pair of, species, um, of colors can recognize each other. So there's a continuous spectrum of birds that can recognize each other, but at the two ends, they can't interbreed anymore. And I think it's all been done with playback experiments that they play the songs to each other and they just are not interested in birds singing the wrong song. And if they net mate, and I don't know about the genetics, I don't know if they pop, try to mate whether they are able to produce offspring. I believe they're just not interested in mating with each other, but I'm not sure about that. And like I said, ring species are just cool because it's, a super challenging counterexample to evolutionary theory and definitions. We don't know whether to call it a species or six species or two species or one species because on the one hand, all along the spectrum, they can interbreed. So it seems like they should be a species. But on the other hand, at the two ends, if they can't interbreed, they should not be considered part of the same species. Yeah. Let's see who we got here. Thanks, everybody.